Jesus came to bring division. Now I'll put the text the, down there in the, in the box below. The references. Jesus Christ came to separate out of the world a people for himself and then he burns the rest. Okay, I fully accept that Jesus is speaking about division in that 10th chapter of St. Matthew's Gospel, but let's think about it in context. Do, we, do you really want us to believe, Lucas, that the Lord was deliberately coming into the world to bring division into families? Let's understand the text in the context in which it was written. Jesus the Lord was anticipating the kind of per persecution that the Romans instigated against the early Christians. Jesus was anticipating the torture and torment and uh, unthinkable things that would happen to the early Christians for professing his name. Those are the circumstances in which father would betray child, mother against daughter, sister against brother and all of those uh, family di dilemmas because that was the dilemma of the world in which the early Christians were going to find themselves and professing the name of Christ was going to cost you your life and perhaps the lives of your families. So. It would have been a matter of expedience, perhaps, to betray your loved ones if it was going to save your own skin and the lives of your own kids. So let's understand this passage about division in its own right. In another text, Jesus says, Peace I leave you, my own peace I give unto you, a peace such as the world cannot give. This is my gift to you. Now let's think about the Christian testimony of witnesses in the modern day. What do you think it's like for Christians in Syria and Iraq? I can hear this cat going, screaming at me. What do you think it's like for Christians in modern day Syria and Iraq when they're threatened with torture and uh, <coughs> compulsory conversion to Islam in the face of death and in, in the face of unthinkable things being done to their loved ones? It doesn't take much to translate this text into the modern day arena. So let's pay credit to those Christians who are born into a different tradition other than your own, who pay with their own blood for witnessing to the name of Christ in the modern world, and who don't in any sense subscribe to your sense of being born again or belonging to your so-called narrow way. But when it comes to judging our works, yours and mine, whose standard is it? Which standard is it? It's revealed by the law. If you're born again, the law's written on your heart and you do it by nature. You won't kill, you won't steal, you won't do this, you won't do that. It's just not in you to do it. Okay, I'm gradually learning how to work <clears throat> all this junk and uh, hopefully I can get the volume to turn up now. Anyway, <clears throat> what Lucas has just said is simply not true. <clears throat> there are lots of people in prison right now who are born again. Christian people of all different descriptions and dispositions. They suffer addiction, they suffer from the ill effects of poverty, they suffer from inappropriate sexual attraction, they suffer the disadvantages of uh, <clears throat> all kinds of defective backgrounds and childhoods, and they genuinely want to reform their lives and live a life in union with Christ. And yet it's like St. Paul says, and strange, isn't it, that, Luke isn't, that Lucas isn't taking a note of what St. Paul says. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, this is in my flesh, for I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good that I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep doing. Now, if I do what I do not want, it's no longer I who do it, but sin who dwells within me. Now, the Lord was crucified between two thieves. He promised one of them that he'd be with him that day in paradise. I don't think there was any evidence that that uh, repentant thief was in any sense measurable by Lucas standards with being born again. The Lord calls those who have broken hearts, who reach out to him for his love and mercy, and that's the gospel. 
when you point out they point out xyz person i say but they're not born again they're not one of god's people oh yeah but they're so good to us they do nice things you know they're kind and they're generous and they've helped us out a lot and all the rest of it uh-huh does that make them one of god's people well, I don't know if it makes him a disciple, but it certainly takes him some way down the road because let's go back to that 10th chapter of St. Matthew's Gospel because Jesus actually says, whoever gives one of these little ones even a cup of cold water because he's a disciple, truly I say to you, he will by no means lose his reward. So yes, simple acts of kindness take you some, down the, some way down the pathway to being acceptable in the sight of God, according to the scriptures here. Now ask yourself carefully, am I a defender of the wicked? Or am I stood with Jesus Christ, who hates the wicked? Well, I don't know. This all seems back to front to me. It says in scripture that the Lord takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that the wicked man should turn again and live. As far as I remember in the scriptures, Jesus was continuously condemned for being in the com company of prostitutes, tax collectors and sinners. And he spent time with them for that very purpose, that they might turn again and live. Mary Magdalene, from whom seven demons, whatever they were, had been cast out. Matthew, the tax collector, the woman caught in adultery. You know, it, his life was just surrounded by people by whatever standards would be called wicked in in that day and in ours as well but he reached out to them in love because he wanted them to turn again from their wickedness and live and that's the gospel good night lucas and god bless